Hi, podcast listeners. Ira here. As a sci-fi regular, you already know we bring you the latest in science and tech each week, straight from the source, the scientists themselves. And if that's something you like about Science Friday, well, we've got more coming your way. We're launching a new podcast. It's called Undiscovered. And it brings those scientists' stories to life with sound and music. And you're about to hear it. The host, Annie Minoff. Hello. And Ella Fetter. Hey, Ira. Are here to tell you more. Take it away. Thanks, Ira. So our favorite part of Science Friday has always been those moments where the researcher pulls back the curtain. So they're not just telling you what they figured out, but they're telling you how they figured it out. And sometimes that means their, their research took a left turn along the way or they screwed something up really badly. That's always fun. Or, or they stumbled onto something they didn't expect at all. That's what Undiscovered's about. It's about all that stuff that gets left out of science journals. And our first episode, which you're about to hear, it's definitely about one of these moments where a team of scientists, they thought they were studying one thing, and they learned that they were studying something very different. So we hope you enjoy it. And if you do, you can subscribe to Undiscovered on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Uh, so here is episode one of Undiscovered. We hope you like it. I'm Ella. And I'm Annie. And you're listening to Undiscovered, a podcast about the backstories of science. This story starts with a crash. This really horrific traffic collision on a highway in Shanxi province, which is in northwestern China. That's Josh Chin. He's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal in Beijing. And the crash he's talking about happened in August of 2012. A double-decker sleeper bus slammed into a tanker carrying a flammable material. I think it was methane. 36 people died. In the state news photo, you can see the blackened husk of the bus sitting on the side of the road. There are some cops in reflective vests. And then at the very back of the picture, you notice this guy. The sort of portly, official-looking guy sort of standing next to the charred wreckage, sort of smiling, very unperturbed by the scene. Users on Sino Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, they noticed the smiling man in the picture, and they were livid. So here are some sample posts from social media, courtesy of our translator, Isabel. And you can hear people are just venting their frustration at this man. Uh, okay, so this one says, with a massive belly from overeating, smiling and laughing at the scene of death, simply inhuman. And um, since he loves smiling so much, I hope these unfortunate dead souls can just take him away with them. Let him smile to his content down there in hell. So Weibo users, they tried to figure out who this guy was. And they went on the internet, did a bunch of image searches, basically trying to turn up more pictures of him. And they hit pay dirt. The smiler was Yan Datsai, Communist Party official and head of the Shanxi Province Work Safety Administration. Right, so pretty much the last guy you want smiling at the scene of an accident. Right. And those Weibo users, they turned up something else, too. Picture after picture of Yan Datsai out on site visits or giving interviews at the office, wearing different luxury wristwatches. Yeah, that's not good. Watches on the order of thousands of dollars and probably much more than, you know, your average provincial official can afford. Or afford without taking bribes. So today on the show, we are going to bring you the story of that smiling official, Yan Datsai, and the Weibo user who took him down. And we're going to try to explain how any of this happens in the first place. In a country that heavily censors the internet, where online speech is not free, can you accuse a party official of corruption and get away with it? Like, what is okay to post and what's not okay to post on Chinese social media? The answer comes to us from some social scientists who were not even trying to answer this question. But they did, by accident, with big data. So in August of 2012, the smiling official, Yan Datsai, he is feeling the heat. There are those pictures of him all over Weibo. He's grinning in front of that burned out bus. People are turning up more pictures showing him wearing these fancy looking watches. But it's not a complete meltdown for the smiling official until another watch lover enters the scene. 
This watch lover's name is Boss Hua. That's his Weibo handle, not his real name, by the way. So Boss Hua is an entrepreneur. He's in his late 30s, kind of slim, wears these really elegant rimless glasses. And he's into luxury, like lifestyle magazine kind of stuff. Right. So pictures on Baswa's Instagram look like something out of Condé Nast Traveler. It's all sepia tone pictures of elaborate espresso drinks. Or lobster dinners. Or luxury hotel suites. He's actually a luxury hotel reviewer on the side. But back in 2012, Baswa was internet famous for doing something very, very specific on Sina Weibo. He'd find pictures of corrupt Chinese officials online and identify their wristwatches. I reached him a few months ago on Skype. Hi, is this Boss Hua? Hello, You'll hear our translator Isabel on the call too. Boss Hua told us this whole watch identifying thing, it started as a lark. Well, at the time, I had just sold my second startup, so I had a lot of free time on my hands, and I really like watches. It was really by random chance that I saw these pictures of officials wearing watches on Weibo. And since I had the time, I tried to identify them. So when Ba Swa says that he, quote, really likes watches, that is an understatement. He is the kind of watch nerd who really cares if your Rolex is stainless steel or Rolexor which is a word that I had to look up. It's some fancy, like, Rolex speak for a combination of stainless steel and gold. <laughs> which is to say that when Ba Swa sets out to identify a watch, it's with the kind of nerdy rigor you'd expect from career investigative journalists. He is relentless. So say Ba Swa sees a picture of some grinning official in front of a burned-out bus, for example. His first step, he heads over to Baidu. This is basically Chinese Google. And he does a search. The idea is he's going to find other pictures of this same guy wearing the same watch at around the same time. And since I'm a programmer, I even wrote a little program to help me grab pictures from the internet. Baswa organizes these pictures into a giant database. So at the end, he had about 10,000 pictures. Oh my god. At the end of all of this sleuthing, he posts his verdict to Weibo. Includes his photo evidence, the watch brand, model, and market price. And in Weibo's court of public opinion, Baswa is the expert watch witness. So when Weibo users turn up pictures of Yan Datsai, that smiling official from the bus crash, and he's wearing all these luxury watches, they know who to call. Did you already have a research file on Yan Datsai? Yes, because he's in my database. Now at this moment, the smiling official makes a very crucial miscalculation. He tries to defend himself. He goes on to Weibo and he says basically, OK, yeah, I've got some watches, but only five. Boss Hua says game on. We'll find oh, my God. He said, um, if you don't remember, I'll help you re- refresh your memories. And every half an hour, I'll post a picture of your watch. And let's see how many you have. <gasps> wow. OK. In the end, the news media reports that internet users surfaced 11 different watches worn by Yan Datsai. Not five, 11. Among them were reportedly a Mont Blanc. Worth $5,000. An Omega. Worth $10,000. And a Vacheron Constantine. Worth at least $25,000. Three weeks later, smiling official Yan Datsai is fired and disappears into the opaque disciplinary machinery of the Communist Party. And Baswa, he becomes a folk hero. Okay, so before we get to our scientists, here is what strikes me about this story. We know that the Chinese government censors the internet. With some regularity. Right. In fact, way back in 2000, then-President Bill Clinton, he gives this speech where he says... Now, there's no question China has been trying to crack down on the internet. Good luck. (laughs) That's sort of like trying to nail jello to the wall. Except by 2012, China's gotten really good at nailing jello. You've probably heard of the Great Firewall. It keeps internet users off of Google, off of Facebook and Twitter. And they've got another weapon, which is people. In China, there are more than 100,000 people whose only job is to take stuff off of the internet that the Chinese government doesn't want there. So in China, most censored posts come down within 24 hours, which means 
within 24 hours, an actual human has looked at your post and decided if it can stay on the Internet. But so here's my question about Baswa then, because he's on Weibo. He's posting about the smiling officials' watches, very strongly implying that there's no legal way this guy could own these. How does Baswa get away with it? Right. Like, why doesn't one of these 100,000 human censors take those posts down? Right. And if the government's not censoring posts that are calling out a specific party official for corruption, what are they censoring? The people who would actually figure this out are at this point 7,000 miles away. They're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There are those three Harvard social scientists I mentioned. We're going to meet two of them, Professor Gary King and one of Gary's grad students at the time, Jennifer Pan. She's now an assistant professor at Stanford. For Gary and Jen, the story actually starts a few years before this watch business. It starts in 2009. And by the way, Gary and Jen do not think they're studying Chinese censorship. Yes, we were interested in automated text analysis. It's a pretty wonky data science thing, but basically, Gary's figuring out ways to help computers analyze really gigantic databases of text. Actually, gigantic databases of Chinese text. Right. So step one, Jen says they need to build a giant database of Chinese text. And we thought, okay, let's look at social media because there's a lot of text there. Gary, Jen, and Gary's other graduate student, Margaret Roberts, they partner with a company that's already downloading Chinese social media posts en masse. They get access to literally millions of posts. And they're about to write up this wonky data science paper when they notice a problem. When they go back to these social media sites, some of the posts they've collected just aren't there anymore. The links are broken. And initially we thought, this meant that there was something wrong with our data, there's something wrong with the data we've been collecting. And then we got one that said, this post has been taken down, it's been deleted, or it's being investigated. Investigated. And then if that wasn't clear enough, over on the bottom right-hand corner, there was a little picture of a little cartoon police officer that we... What? Have cut, we've, a little, little picture of a police officer, that's right. Uh, eventually we learned that there's cartoon internet police, and they're Jing Jing and Cha Cha. And they, they have names? They have names, yes. You can Google them, and you'll find these funny little pictures. I totally Googled them. Jing Jing and Cha Cha wear little blue police uniforms. And they're usually shown standing on top of computer mice or keyboards in this kind of crouching posture that makes it look like they're surfing. Like they're surfing the web, I guess. They put them everywhere just to remind you that you're, you're being watched. That's when we knew that we were encountering censorship. The problem wasn't a few broken links. Posts were missing because they'd been censored. So had you ever studied censorship before? Uh, none of us had ever studied censorship. Um, I'd never studied China. Um, uh, you speak Chinese? <laughs> I don't speak Chinese, no. So here's Gary. He's looking at this thing he doesn't quite understand, in a language he doesn't even read. But it doesn't matter. He knows they have to follow this lead. And so we, we immediately changed what we were doing. So censorship on Chinese social media, you can kind of think of it like this big black box. Every day, people are feeding stuff into this box. They post to Weibo, for example. Most of these posts come back out the other side, but not all. Some get stuck in that black box. And what internet users and scholars and policy people have wanted to know for a long time is this. What gets stuck in the black box? What does the Chinese government actually censor? And it's not like we don't know anything about this. Every once in a while, a Chinese government memo will get leaked. People have actually interviewed censors. And obviously you've got 700 million Chinese internet users noticing when their posts disappear. The problem is that this is all anecdotal. So enter Gary and Jen. They're vacuuming up millions of Chinese social media posts. And when they notice that they're disappearing, they realize something big. As fast as China's 100,000 human censors are reading posts, taking them off of the internet, Gary and Jen are downloading those same posts faster. When a post appears on the internet and then disappears into the black box of censorship, they can see that. And with this data, they can answer the big question, definitively. What are those 100,000 censors taking off of the internet? Except it didn't work like that. 
people that talk about big data, they sometimes talk about the end of theory. You don't have to theorize anymore. You just look at the data and it tells you the answer. Well, we were being buried by enormous quantities of data. And it wasn't speaking to us. <laughs> it was just... It, it was not projecting its loud big data voice and saying, Gary, this is what China doesn't want on the internet. <laughs> exactly. That's right. They were just... It, it, it was just burying us. Turns out, having a lot of data, that's not enough. You've got to ask the data the right question. And Gary and Jen, they'd started with the obvious question. What would they censor? The obvious answer, criticism. Anything that criticizes the government or its politics or its leaders. And so we set up our, our telescopes, essentially, to look for that. And when we looked for that, we didn't see that. We didn't see anything like that. What they saw was actually pretty weird. Pro-government stuff and anti-government stuff, it got censored at about the same rate. Which is bizarre. Let me just be clear about this. You can say the leaders of this town are all stealing money. Uh, they're putting it in overseas bank accounts. And here's the bank accounts. And here's how much money. Um, and by the way, they all have mistresses. And here are their names. That will not be censored. Wow. Um, so we were quite confused for a while. So this doesn't seem to make any sense. But it does fit with the story of Baswa. He's there. He's calling out this smiling official saying, hey, this guy's got watches he shouldn't have. If criticizing party officials is OK, then it makes sense that that can stay up. But you can imagine now Jen and Gary are really stuck because they've asked the data a question. Is censorship about taking criticism off of the Internet? Data says, nope. And now they need to ask another question. They need a new hypothesis. And we tried a bunch of them. And we finally came upon uh, one that made everything clarify beautifully. They observe a trend, something to explain why some posts get stuck in the black box and some don't. And now it's clear what they have to do. They have to put this beautiful clarifying hypothesis to the test. They have to feed posts into the black box. Publish hundreds of fake social media posts to the Chinese internet and see which disappear. Coming up, Gary and Jen discover the words that will get you censored on the Chinese internet. Those are the magic words right there. Those are the magic words. And a twist in the tale of the dueling watch lovers, smiling official Yan Datsai versus Weibo vigilante Boss Hua. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. I actually love listening to audiobooks while I'm knitting. This is true. You came into the office with the most gigantic infinity scarf I have ever seen, it's completely not, powered. I mean, it's normal by sized. audiobooks. It was powered by audiobooks. That part's true. So if you love audiobooks too, Audible has a huge selection, plus original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. And you can download them on your iPhone, Android device, Fire tablet, iPod, or other MP3 player. In fact, one book I would super recommend if you like science and backstories is Jana Levin's Black Hole Blues. It's a book about how we found gravitational waves. She is an absolutely beautiful writer, a theoretical physicist, and she reads her own audiobook. And if that sounds enticing, you can listen to it for free. Audible's offering undiscovered listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. So just go to audible.com slash undiscovered, download a title free, and start listening. That's audible.com slash undiscovered, and start your free trial membership today. So at this point in our story, our Harvard social scientists, Gary and Jen, They've stumbled onto this black box. The black box of Chinese social media censorship. And they've got a hypothesis about what exactly is disappearing into this black box. Gary says this hypothesis... Made everything clarify beautifully. So to test it, Gary, Jen, and their colleague Margaret Roberts, they design an experiment. And it works like this. They will create 200 fake accounts on 100 social media sites all over China. And then... When something controversial happens, like, say, some party official gets caught smiling at the site of a gruesome traffic accident, something like that, they are going to post about this controversy all over Chinese social media, on message boards, on Weibo, and then they'll see what those 100,000 censors take down. And this is a lot of work, as you'd imagine. Writing social media posts, creating fake accounts, guess who's going to do it? Undergrads. 
So my name is Manette Yu. I was a research assistant for the big research project on Chinese government censorship. Minette was one of about 10 researchers that Gary and Jen recruited to write posts. She grew up in China, but moved to LA in the ninth grade. I did browse Chinese social media here and there, use it occasionally to connect with friends from childhood. Mostly though, Minette says she was a lurker. She was checking out what other people posted, but not actually posting herself. But that changes in the spring of 2013 in a big way. Because Gary and Jen have Minette creating fake profiles on forums, websites, blogs, etc. And when a controversy starts trending, Minette is on it, composing posts about it under all of these different aliases. Sometimes she's writing about a specific person, like artist activist Ai Weiwei. Other times she's writing about policy, like the time the government decides to fine drivers for running yellow lights, which one Weibo user points out basically invalidates the concept of a yellow light. It was kind of like massaging other people's messages into my own writing and then just, you know, make it more exaggerated or play up some of the points uh, or, or play down. So Gary and Jen's research assistants, they're writing about people, they're writing about policy, and they are writing about protest. People taking to the streets, organizing, doing something. Like in April, the first month of this experiment, the team sees a bunch of posts on social media about Panshu. This is a village in eastern China. A block of farmland had been requisitioned by the municipal government, supposedly to build a golf course. So some of these villagers were being kicked off their collective farm to make room for a golf course. And they were pissed. They started protesting. The police arrived. Some of the villagers were arrested. And the villagers, I think, had surrounded the municipal government. Um, so when the police arrived, they kind of liberated the officials and tried to negotiate with the villagers. It's a total mess. And this mess spills out onto social media. So the Harvard team has to move fast. They pump out 100 posts about the protests. A few days later, they go back, see if their posts are still there. Now, at the same time that Gary and Jen's research assistants, people like Minette, they're pushing China's censors, seeing what they'll put up with, essentially. Chinese internet users are kind of doing the same thing. In fact, you could say that they've been running this exact experiment for years. In 2010 and 2011, you have to remember, social media is changing so fast. The Arab Spring's happening, and a lot of it is coordinated online. Microblogging is suddenly a thing. And no one knows quite what to expect. So Chinese social media users are just figuring it out day by day. How much can they get away with? According to Josh Chin, that's the Wall Street Journal reporter, the real breakthrough moment happens in July 2011 with another accident. A deadly crash of a high-speed train in China dents public confidence and raises concerns about possible corruption. There was this high-speed train crash in, in the city of Wenzhou where it looked like the government had been, been trying to cover it up. And there was this just onslaught of public commentary, mostly on Weibo. You know, Internet users just heaping abuse and doubt uh, on the government over its handling of this. And the censors just couldn't keep up. So a lot of these posts are staying online. And for Weibo users, it's like overnight dissent had been normalized. So then it became a kind of a pastime after this, and, and you did have internet users going after officials who they thought might be corrupt. And it became a bit of a game almost, almost a form of entertainment. Some of the people who were taking shots at the government were so-called big Vs, the Vs for verified account. So basically, these are the important people on Weibo, the internet celebs, people with millions of followers. So you've got Baswa. He's posting about all these suspicious watches from his verified account. But the real heavy hitters, in terms of audience anyway, are guys like Charles Shu. Shu's a Chinese-American venture capitalist. He's liberal-leaning. He's got about 12 million followers on Weibo. And he's posting about how rival political parties should have a role in government. One post he shares about tainted food, it gets reshared 17,000 times. Shu has one of the biggest megaphones in China. He's criticizing the government, and he seems to be getting away with it. It's like, what do you have to do to get a censor's attention? By July 2013, Gary and Jen are in a position to answer exactly that question. By this point, their team submitted 1,200 posts to 100 different social media platforms all over China. 
Research assistants like Minette have checked back. They've recorded which of those posts got taken down. And the results are clear. Here's Gary. You can criticize the leaders and their policies and the state as much as you want. But if you say, and let's go protest, that will be censored. Those are the magic words right there. Those are the magic words. Protest. Those moments when people in China are out on the streets, organizing, taking action. Like those villagers in Panshu. Those posts that talked about protest were censored about 30 percent more than posts that didn't. According to Gary and Jen, social media censorship in China, it's not about stifling political speech. It's about stifling political action. I want to read just one post that you included in your study, and this, this is not one that one of your students wrote. This is an actual post from someone posting on Chinese social media. And this person wrote, Don't talk any more about anti-corruption. Don't even talk about China's current democracy, rule of law, and human rights. Those things were completely destroyed over 20 years ago under the treads of tanks. Our so-called court of law is merely for show. The party providing oversight on the party is an absolute joke. Wake up, Chinese citizens. That is allowed to remain on the Chinese internet. Absolutely. That's right. Wow. It's kind of a, a profound insight that the Chinese government has made here, though. Essentially, they're saying actions, not words. I think are that's what matters. right. I think that's right. That's right. Uh, sticks and stones, right? That's it's really that. It's really that. According to Gary and Jen, this is the line the Chinese government has drawn on social media: criticism, okay. Action, not okay. Argue all you want in your strongest, most vitriolic language. Just don't try to do anything. And you could call it the sticks and stones rule. And according to the sticks and stones rule, Baswa, our Weibo vigilante, should be golden. He's not posting about protests. He's just observing. Hey, this smiling official has a lot of nice watches. And it's true. Baswa says his posts about the smiling official's watches were not generally censored. So one reason for that might be that sometimes he did the censoring himself. Baswa says a lot of the time he'd go back a day later and delete his own posts. He figured one way to stay on the censor's good side was to basically do their jobs for them. Still, his Weibo account wasn't suspended. His posts got around. In fact, it kind of seemed like the authorities were taking note and agreeing that the smiling official was a problem. In August 2013, almost a year to the day after Baswa's watch spotting spree, the smiling official appears in a Chinese courtroom surrounded by press photographers. In the CCTV footage, Yan Datsai sits between two police officers. He's wearing a bright orange prison vest, and a judge reads him the charges that he took bribes and has undeclared bank savings. <laughs> He has no objection to these charges. A week later, the smiling official is sentenced to 14 years in prison. And I asked Josh Chin, the Wall Street Journal reporter, like, this can't possibly be a good press day for the government, right? And he said, actually, it kind of was. Because halfway through 2013, the party's in the middle of this huge anti-corruption campaign. They know that they have a problem with with this, and it's really hurting the party's image to have all of these guys running around with luxury watches or driving around a Mercedes and whatnot. So it's good. It would, Yang Datsai goes down. It looks good for the party, and it's you know all around a sort of a feel good story. The watch spotter Baswa definitely comes out ahead. In 2013, he's being feted by Sina, the company that owns Sina Weibo, at this fancy award ceremony in Beijing. <laughs> The government gets some good press, gets to look like it's getting rid of the bad apples. And Weibo users, they get to feel like their voices matter. So, like Josh says, everyone's smiling. Including the one guy who really shouldn't be. Smiling official Yang Datsai. During his sentencing, there were there was sort of CCTV footage of him listening to his sentencing, and he's there, and he's kind of smirking again. But this is where our story takes a profoundly weird turn. So the really kind of the strange twist on the whole Yang Datsai story is that, you know, he goes to trial, 
Uh, he gets convicted. Everything seems great. And then, you know, the next month, one of the heroes in this story is suddenly taken away by police for interrogation. So it's 12 days after the smiling official's sentencing, and Baswa is in Beijing. He's actually there to pick up a real estate award for some company that he's just joined. Remember, Baswa's got this side gig as a luxury hotel reviewer. So naturally, he's staying at one of the city's poshest hotels, a Shangri-La. The hotel's inside Beijing's tallest skyscraper. It's actually 64 floors before you even get to the lobby. And then everywhere you look, it's these floor-to-ceiling windows and these crazy master-of-the-universe views. I don't usually get up early, but I did that day. I was at the elevator on the 64th floor, and as soon as I stepped out, I heard someone call my name, my full name. Usually people don't do that. They usually just call me Mr. Wu or something like that. I thought those two men were event staff, so I nodded, and they just charged at me. They didn't say who they were, didn't produce a badge or anything. They put handcuffs on me and pushed my head down. It was like the scene you see in Chinese movies, when criminals are taken away by police. They grab your hair and they push your head down. But this was a luxury hotel, luxury hotel, so there were a lot of foreigners around. Everyone was shocked because no one knew what was happening. And I'm also this pretty well-known reviewer in the hotel industry. So the people at the hotel, they didn't know what was going on, and everyone was nervous. There's this kind of ridiculous Keystone Cops moment. After they make this big show of cuffing Baswa in the lobby, the police remember they haven't actually searched his room. So they put him back in the elevator, and everyone goes back to his room so that they can confiscate his stuff. The hotel staff thought it was all very disgraceful, so they told us to use the freight elevator instead of the guest one to go downstairs. We went down, and I got escorted into the police car. The news hits Weibo, and the internet flips out. Partly it's the whiplash. Just weeks ago, CCTV had been running stories about how Internet surveillance has given the public an increasingly active role in monitoring the authorities. And now, one of the Internet's most beloved corruption busters is in cuffs. Even Baswa isn't totally sure how he got here. At first, they didn't say at all why they took me. My first instinct was, oh, was it because of Yang Dacai? Was it because of the smiling official? They just gave me this mysterious smile and said, guess. Baswa says he spent 24 hours in police custody, most of it being interrogated in the police station basement. He says the cops never asked about the smiling official's watches. Instead, they accused him of blackmailing a shady luxury goods company. Which he denies. It's kind of messy. But what we can say is what happened to Baswa seems to fit a pattern. At the exact same time that the official is being sentenced, at the same time that the state looks like it is cleaning up its act, social media celebrities and journalists and activists are being detained. Beijing calls it a campaign against online rumor-mongering. Weibo users see a crackdown on dissent. And Big V's, those important people on Weibo with millions of followers, they're among the hardest hit. So Charles Shu, the Big V who blogged about rule of law, he's arrested. Officially, the charge is soliciting prostitutes. But pretty soon, Shu's on state TV, baggy-eyed in a prison vest, confessing that he posted, quote, irresponsibly on Weibo. Baswa did not have the million-plus followers that Shu had, but he might have been influential enough to get caught in the net. Wall Street Journal reporter Josh Chin. I mean, if you talk to Chinese media scholars and internet watchers, you know, what they were telling me was that Baswa had just become too big of a figure. Not that he had any interest in, in organizing anything or leading anything, but that he was just, he was, he was becoming a rival source of authority, uh, which, is, which is something right. that the Communist Party just can't brook. I think that's probably the dynamic that was at play. And they thought he was getting a little too big for his britches, and they decided to, uh, to have a talk with him. If you go to Baswa's Weibo today, you won't find a trace of his watch spotting. The posts are all gone. He's deleted them. Baswa followed the sticks and stones rule. He posted about watches, 
not protests. And in the end, it didn't matter. But I don't take that to mean that Gary and Jen were wrong. The whole reason their work is powerful is it does not rely on anecdotal evidence. It relies on lots and lots of data. And that's not to say that those 11 million posts are the entire story of censorship. Right. Baswa's surprise in the hotel lobby, it happened offline. That doesn't get picked up in social media data. But what all those posts can do is give you an aerial view of censorship as a system. This is the 10,000-foot view. And from 10,000 feet, you can see order in this chaos. But if you're one of those people on the ground like Baswa, chances are it just feels like chaos. Actually, at one point in our interview, Baswa asked this question. Uh, Have you seen Game of Thrones? Hidden within Game of Thrones are a lot of issues with China's internet censorship. Okay, so hear him out. First, there's the game of the various government departments. Different departments are battling it out for the right to manage the internet. And secondly, among the people using the internet, two different camps emerge. Some maybe really do support the government. Some maybe just want to get something out of siding with the government. In other words, it is a chaotic, dark Game of Thrones world out there. A lot of shady characters, competing interests. They're scheming. There are a lot of desires, and also a lot of things that are deprived of basic human decency. And if you're a person living in this chaotic Game of Thrones world, trying to predict how you fit into all these convoluted plot lines, what's going to happen to you, you just can't do it. You're Rob Stark, thinking you've just made this great alliance with the House of Frey, and you walk into what you think is going to be this celebratory banquet. And it's the Red Wedding. Total slaughter. Or your Baswa, stepping into the lobby of a five-star hotel, thinking you're going to pick up an award, and instead you're handcuffed and shoved in the freight elevator. And this might be the Chinese government's greatest asset in the end. Uncertainty. Because from 10,000 feet up, you can see order in this chaos. But on the ground, you can never be sure if what's statistically significant across millions of posts will be significant for you. In retrospect, it seems possible that Gary and Jen caught Chinese social media, or Weibo anyway, at a transitional moment. They ran their experiment in the spring of 2013, at which point Josh Chin, the Wall Street Journal reporter, he thinks they were basically on the money. At the time, I think there was this very clear line between sort of criticizing the government and making calls for political action. Uh, but what's happened recently under Xi Jinping is that the line has shifted so much, so quickly, that you know people are no longer really trying to skirt the line as, as, as much as they used to. Like people are just so scared that it's gonna that it's gonna keep moving and that they're gonna get caught on the wrong side that now they don't even really bother tiptoeing close to it anymore. These days, Baswa plays it safe. His Instagram feed is all pretty pictures of hotels and food. He he said he's leaving Weibo this month. Oh, so you're not gonna be on Weibo by the time we air it. He said he will log in, but he won't post anything new. The man who brought down the smiling official is now officially a Weibo lurker. Undiscovered is reported and produced by me, Annie Minoff, and me, Ella Fetter. Our editor is Christopher Intagliata. Thanks also to Danielle Dana, Christian Scotta, Brandon Ector, and Rachel Boughton. Fact-checking help by Michelle Harris. Original music by Daniel Peter Schmidt. I am Robot and Proud, wrote our theme. Special shout-out this week to our story consultant, Ari Daniel, to Isabel for translations and voicing, and to the third member of that Harvard team. Gary and Jen's colleague, Margaret Roberts, for her assistance. Gary and Jen and Margaret actually have a new study coming out. They're looking at the stuff the Chinese government secretly posts to the internet, not what they take down. Super interesting stuff. You can check that out at undiscoveredpodcast.org. And thanks to our launch partner, the John Templeton Foundation. 
See you next week.